Live long and prosper. So in this video series, I'm going to be talking through the social justice elements of every episode of the original series of Star Trek. Um, the thing that inspired this project was actually a Fox News article which argued that Star Trek has in some way betrayed its traditional commitment to sort of political neutrality or middle ground by embracing progressive politics. In this series, we're going to see that Star Trek has always embraced progressive politics and it's always been aspirational for social justice in various senses. Um, I am taking a broad perspective on social justice here, um, so that may, that may include multiple different types of uh, social justice, whether that's racial, whether that's economic, whether that's religious, whether that's abilities, gender and sexuality, um, anything, anything broadly considered. Um, I will go through every episode. Some of the episodes I will, I will interview fellow Trekkies and talk with them about it. Um, and then below, uh, in the descriptions, I will give you additional information about the episodes, particularly, uh, their original air date, who wrote the, the, uh, the screenplay and who, uh, directed that episode. I also want to dedicate this series to my dad, Michael Allen Zapkin. Uh, he was an OG Trekkie from back in the day, and uh, it was watching the original series with him that I came to love Star Trek. In this video, we're going to be talking about patterns of force. Um, I'm joined for this uh, discussion by my friend Matt Page. Uh, Matt, thanks for being here. Thanks, Phil. I was just um, very uh, excited to be here today. Um, my name is Matt Page. I am a armchair historian, philosopher, and uh, science fiction enthusiast. Um, I'm a little friend of uh, Mr. Zavkin here, and I'm uh, very excited to uh, talk about this episode. Yeah, this is a this is a good episode for us because a bunch of people in our friend group in high school were really interested in totalitarian societies, um, and and patterns of force is clearly concerned with that. So, what happens in patterns of force? Um, the Enterprise has to go and sort of investigate this planet where a dude named John Gill, himself a historian, um, had gone uh, several years earlier. He was basically supposed to observe this fairly primitive warlike culture. Um, but uh, when the Enterprise shows up in the, the sort of outer atmosphere of this planet, they the planet launches a nuclear warhead at them, which is a technology they're not supposed to have. So they uh, tap into some of the planetary broadcasts and basically they find out that this planet, Echos, has uh, d essentially declared war on its peaceful neighbor, Zeon. Uh, Kirk and Spock go down to the planet to try and figure out what's been going on and what John Gill has been up to. And they find out that this is now Planet Nazi. Um, like everything legitimately exactly like the Nazis. Uh, swastikas. A violent racial ideology uh, targeting Zeons. Um, the different sort of ranks, the different organizations, the SS, the Gestapo, etc., etc., all of that stuff recreated. This is parallel worlds theory in a way, because again, like I've talked about this in, in the series before, Gene Roddenberry loved this idea of parallel worlds, but it's not parallel worlds because they find out that John Gill is the Fuhrer. So John Gill, this historian who knew about Nazi Germany, has driven the whole thing. So Kirk and Spock have to try and get a hold of John Gill and figure out why he did this thing. 
Uh, they get captured by the Nazis. There's various uh, bits and pieces where they impersonate Nazis and they're sneaking around. They're sort of allied with some of uh, the Zeon underground resistance. Um, there's some various stuff that goes on. And ultimately, they end up discovering that John Gill has essentially been drugged and Malakon, the second in command, has taken over and he's driving the war against Zeon, which John Gill didn't actually want. Um, at the end of the episode, John Gill gets shot by Malakon, Malakon gets shot by a Zeon, and then everybody's like, hey, maybe let's not have a genocide. And that just seems to be cool with everyone. Like, there is a 360 degree turn from let us wipe this this other planet out of existence to can't we all just get along? So that's what we've got going on in the episode. Um, so, so there's a lot, I think, to talk about here from a social justice perspective. So where do you want to start? Um, well, the first, one of the first things I thought of um, when watching the episode, because I haven't watched a lot of the original Star Trek episodes, but uh, it struck me that most of the aliens that they encountered were just basically humans. So yeah. each episode kind of turns into a sociology exercise um, because they're able to basically create any any human social situ situation and drop themselves into it and examine it. So I thought that was yeah. a pretty interesting uh, uh, <laughs> observation. Um, yeah, that That's one of the things with parallel worlds theory is it it lets the show explore contemporary issues without exploring contemporary issues because it's in the future and it's on another planet. It's yeah, also it's I also a lot cheaper. It works so well. Yeah, uh, but it's later, also just a later, lot cheaper to have human beings and be yeah, like, yeah, yeah. I understand. You know, this later, is our aliens. iterations. Yeah up the the production value and the makeup but i thought that was a pretty interesting yeah. way of looking at the uh, original series as like um different ways of looking at uh, the human experience yeah um as far as the episode goes um i'm gonna start right at the end um okay. bones brings up the absolute uh power corrupts absolutely but I got the impression throughout most of the episode that it wasn't necessarily the power that corrupted. It was the actual ideology itself that was corrupting the Ecosian people. Yeah. Like you saw that Malakon was a believer in, in the ideology itself, and that was motivating him to gain that power. Yeah, I think that's right. And it it's interesting that McCoy says that to Kirk who is the most powerful person on this ship. Like, he he has the authority to order anybody on this ship to die for him at any point. And so that idea of power in itself being corrupting, I think it is kind of undercut by the episode in exactly yeah, the way you see, you see Kirk himself you know going down to the planet and like and doing the the mission himself and not ordering anybody else to take that risk yeah which of course is a thing I mean I get why they do that because Kirk is clearly the hero and William Shatner as an yeah, actor yeah yeah you need to have, have the best roles, star but, the the yeah yeah but realistically, the captain of the starship is not going down to every planet and going into these dangerous situations. Like, no, absolutely you're have not. Specialists, yeah. So then, if the issue is with the ideology, and I I'm fully on board with that that assertion, why? I guess becomes the interesting question. Like, what is it about like? Because what John Gill wanted, right, was the efficiency of the Nazi state. And we'll, yeah. we'll talk about that idea. He wanted the efficiency of the Nazi state without necessarily having the genocidal 
component. But then he indulges, directly indulges the worst tendencies of the ideology itself, which is yeah, which is contrary to what, what he was trying to accomplish. Because he was trying to accomplish Nazi Germany without the cruelty, but then he immediately institutes everything that was the worst about Nazi Germany. Like yeah. the otherization of the of the Zeon people. Yeah, I mean, I guess it's hard to tell how much Gil really engaged in that. But clearly that idea comes from somewhere. And I think this is kind of the maybe the thing that I'm uh, that I'm wondering at what the thing that I'm trying to, to get at, I guess, is like, could you have the efficient, the, the social organization, I guess, of an efficient state like the Nazi state without having an other? Does there need to be some big enemy or is that is that always going to to develop when you're when you're setting up I, a society this way I, I i think it's probably inevitable in uh in fascist sort of organizations because they re rely on the other in order to uh in order to keep the unity of the state um mm -hmm. i i would think that gill did have probably some uh, Probably not to the extent that um, Malakon was persecuting the Zeons, but he definitely, I am sure, was culpable in setting up the Zeons as the the, uh, the scapegoat for um, establishing the Ecosian unity. Because previously they had been talking about how um, Ecos was in a state of like sheer anarchy, and yeah. the reason that Gil, as far as I understand it chose Nazi Germany was because of how quickly they rose up from a very chaotic state. And he wanted to emulate, I mean, and he wanted to emulate Nazi Germany, but then, you know, he emulated them a little too well. Um, he brought in too much of the uh, otherization. I don't think he, I mean, and we're talking about historian, you know, in the 24th century, right? And yeah. he would be very removed from the the effects of the holocaust is in terms of like versus our society because we yeah. still you know, still have surviving holocaust um victims but um one of the things that kirk said i don't know i don't know if it was kirk that said it or one of the other uh rebels but when they were testing him he said um what are you going to do when the last Z zeon is dead you're going to turn the gun on each other i thought that was a pretty interesting uh indictment of that whole system that he had uh and his little outburst <laughs> yeah you know that's actually a really interesting line um i mean obviously one of the things that we see consistently with totalitarian systems is a continual expansion of who is targeted as the other um but one of the things that Hannah Arendt says in her book about totalitarianism is that totalitarianism doesn't have a core ideology as such. What it has is devotion to the whims of the leader. And so that re I think that really is a, a very serious danger in any sort of totalitarian society that at any point you can become part of the outside group. So there is yeah. that, like, yeah, obviously, like, Nazi Germany is driven primarily by anti-Semitism, but we we should also not forget that the Roma were targeted, LGBT people were targeted, Slavs were targeted, communists and socialists were targeted. All of these... Yeah, we, we, talk about, we talk about the six million Jews who died and... and the Holocaust, but the death toll of the Holocaust was was far higher in total. Yeah, something like six million combined other people who who were not Jews as well. I think yeah. is is the official yeah. count by most historians. So, and of course, one of the and I, I think in this sense maybe the Stalin is more totalitarian even than than Hitler because. 
yes, there's the idea of like class enemies and counter revolutionaries, but who gets lumped in with that can continually expand in the Soviet Union. Yeah, like, it Trotsky was, it was, gets lumped in. It was a more nebulous other. It was it was the other was the enemy of the state, and whoever was the enemy of the state seemed to change day to day, yeah. moment to moment. Yeah. So that anybody I think we would see that. Go ahead. Oh, I was just, just going to finish saying that anybody could, you know, be a victim of the uh, regime. Yeah. And I think we would, I think we would have seen that with Nazi Germany as well, except for the fact that historical circumstances kind of destroyed them before, uh, before they got to that that point where they yeah. could really develop that nebulous other. Yeah, I yeah. Think that's a good way of putting it. <clears throat> but I, I want to pick up on something else that you had said um this idea that we even today in 2023 have these living connections with the holocaust this episode comes out in 1968 which is much much closer yeah and it's worth noting that both william shatner and leonard nimoy the two members of the crew who initially go down to the planet are Jewish. Um, and so I don't, I, I don't, I don't know. Like I'm, I'm divided for myself, whether or not the more sort of horrific aspect of the episode is when Shatner and Nimoy are imprisoned by the Nazis and being tortured or when they are impersonating the Nazis. Yeah, I thought there was some um, some complexity and, and depth to the people who were impersonating the Nazis and infiltrating the regime. Um, they were con they they seem to be conscious of the moral sacrifice that they were making of themselves, yeah. but in the end, that they they ended up accomplishing the overthrow of Malachan and the stopping of the um, genocide of the Zeons. So there is something to be said about um, compromising these people, compromising their morals to co to collaborate with these with these Nazis in order to um, ultimately overthrow that government. But it's an interesting because because they they um, they all seem to be aware of how badly they are, you know, morally compromised. Yeah. Um, especially, um, what was that guy's name? Enig, the um, mm -hmm. the enforcer. I don't know how to also describe him. I don't, I'm not sure about the Nazi ranks, but he was the guy that was in charge of torturing uh, Kirk and Spock that ended up um, helping them ultimately overthrow Malachon. Yeah. But he seemed to be complicit in some terrible things um, over the years to you know, maintain his cover, but at the end he was instrumental in overthrowing the, the brutal regime. So who's to say like whether he was right or wrong in what he did, but he, but he was noble enough to compromise his own moral integrity for the good of other people so that they keep their hands clean. So I don't know. Yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a lot. Of, I think there's a lot to be said about that. Yeah. No, so I think that's really interesting. I mean, because it is ultimately, again, it is this weird, like, 360 or 180, I guess, degree turn from, like, the ships are, are literally in space, ready to start destroying Zeon, and then yeah. everybody's just sort of like, okay, guess we're not doing that, and I'm, I'm <laughs> perfectly happy with that. I feel like it that's more of... I don't know. I, I, I'm more, I'm more willing to gloss over that as a symptom of of uh, TV writing, mm. um, because we don't need like a half an hour of them turning the ships around when they're ultimately going to be able to do that anyway. It was nice yeah. to just get. The, it was a, it, it was actually a very uh, a, a, a well tied up episode at the end. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that's right it's a it's a it's a 
you have a certain amount of time for a TV episode issue more than anything else. I think that's definitely the case here. Um, but what part of, but I, 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 I can, I can extrapolate I, what I think you're saying. It's like, what part of that military would be true believers and would ignore John Gill, yeah. favor of Malachon, and continue to carry out that mission? Yeah. I mean, that's the thing is like, this is, this has become a society based on hatred of the other. And then that hatred is basically just dropped as soon yeah. as, as John Gill <laughs> says, John Gill says, Oh no, don't do this. And they're all like, well, okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's a very, <laughs> and I mean, we can like we can see but that. I also, but, that, but you know, if you look at if you look at Germany itself after after World War II, they there was no there was no resurgence of the fanaticism against against Ju against Judaism. So yeah. it, it, and I don't know, you, you know, I, I'm I'm on the spot here, so I can't tell you exactly. But there was a writer. Um, or a historian or philosopher talked about how Germany seemed to be like in a deep sleep during World War II and led around as if in a nightmare. I don't know mm -hmm. if you remember that 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 quote. Um, I can't no, think I'm of it. I'm not sure if I know it. But it, it, it was it was like if Ger like Germany had been walking around in a nightmare for however long they were in Nazi Germany and they had awoken. Um, but I thought I thought that was interesting thought about the uh, the society and also an interesting way of maybe excusing their culpability as a society in the crimes yeah. that Nazi Germany committed. But I also think that on some level it was true that they were swept up in this fervor and this resurgence of the power of their nation that they were willing to overlook crimes that they didn't have to think about. And because the Holocaust wasn't something that the average German had to think about. Yeah. What I so one thing I think that's that's maybe an important difference here. I don't I don't do we have, I can't remember if we have a good sense of how long John Gill was there. Um, I feel like it wasn't massively massively long. It wasn't a short but, period of time either. There was there was years mentioned as time periods. Yeah, but I don't think it was any longer than Nazi Germany had existed in reality. Yeah. So, because the, like, the thing that I'm thinking is like, we see in this episode that they've established an SS, they've established a Gestapo, they've established the Wehrmacht, etc., etc. Have they also established, I, I don't know, the Gill Youth or something like this? The Like the equivalent of the Hitler Youth? Because I think that was actually one of the things where, like, you had longer-term issues with people sort of denazifying what, like, for people who were adults in in the mid '30s when the Nazis come to power, is probably much easier to then say, okay, this was not right, but I have in my brain a model for thinking about the world in a different way. But if you were Hitler youth for 10 years or something like that, like you would be a much, much yeah. more imbued with that ideology. And I think in the post-war period, that's there was a there was a good amount of tension with people who like had that framework for a different way of living. From the Weimar Republic era versus people who, who had only known the Nazi state. Yeah, that's a that's an interesting point. Um, especially uh, on the Echosian plan, I wonder what what similar effects we may be seeing. Um, you know, I know that we saw that yeah. everybody had, had a jubilee and a, an epiphany moment to not hate the the Zeons, but. Um, you know, for lo lo looking at looking at in this in this aspect, we may see in 10, 10, 15, 20 years a resurgence of the of the anti zan sentiment. Yeah, especially if there's money to be made on it. Yeah. So, uh, 
speaking of money or sli slightly uh, taking off from that idea, I want to talk about the, I the uh, idea that Gill presents as his sort of justification for why Nazi Germany. The idea that the Nazis were the most efficient state humanity ever created. Do you have a do you have a take on this and whether or not that's um, good enough I justification? Also, I mean, I would I, I wouldn't dispute him that Nazi Germany was an efficient state. They were incredibly organized and they managed to um, create a impressive apparatus for doing what they did. Um, but we have to look at World War II. They, they were using horses in World War II. They were only a country to have to resort to using horses. So, I mean, they were, they were very, they were a lot, their bark was bigger than their bite in terms of, in terms of how powerful that society was. But I would also look at China and, um, Russia, honestly, as other, um, candidates for efficient states. They both were basically agrarian in the 19th, excuse me, the, the beginning of the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And they built themselves up into major industrial powers by the end of it, by the end of the century. China, in less than 50 years, basically, brought, built themselves up into an industrial power when much of the country was agrarian. And yeah. Russia, the same way, they were basically agrarian before uh, 1917, as I recall. Mm -hmm. they launched the uh, their rapid industrial planning, and the, the effects are debated, you know about uh, whether it was efficient or moral or human or, or humane, but the fact is they did it and it mm -hmm. happened. Um, but I think comparatively I few people would say that, that either the Great Leap Forward or uh, Stalin's five year plans were humane. But yeah, that, yeah, we could we could have an argument about whether they're efficient. Or another. <laughs> yeah. But I would also, but but look, but thinking about that, I would also look. I would also turn a critical eye to John Gill. I wouldn't, if if I were Kirk, and I would take in custody of John Gill, I would try him for crimes, because any yeah. historian worth his salt would not do what he did, and especially the way he he talked about creating a Nazi Germany that uh, isn't corrupt and this and that, but then he goes ahead and, and, and in, like, a, like, like I touched on before, indulges the worst tendencies of Nazi Germany. Yeah. The, the, the other vacation of the Zeons, the, uh, um, the propaganda state, the war against other nations for, you know, manufactured reasons. Yeah. Um, but I understand that wasn't him that did that part, but he created the state that amplified that those worst tendencies. And yeah, he just basically like should have known better. I, I think, I really yeah. think he should have known better. Like even Kirk knew better. Yeah. Well, and so I think this is actually one, one sort of interesting thing of rewatching the original series from the 21st century. Um, I don't know what the historical consensus was on, on Nazi Germany and their relative efficiency in 1968, but like you, you had said they were incredibly efficient at building a military machine and a genocidal apparatus. But they actually weren't that efficient at building a society as such. And I, I think this is now increasingly the consensus among historians who actually study this is like the totalitarian states of World War II were not able to provide resources for their people, were not able to provide food, were not able to provide the sort of basic necessities. Whereas democratic states on on the opposition side especially the u.s and we of course benefited from not being in the war until 1941 but like like there's a there's a great story from when rome fell um eisenhower was in charge of the the push that took rome and 
the Americans and the British weren't really sure what to expect when they got into Rome uh, because they didn't know whether these would be like diehard fascists who were going to fight them in the streets or, or what to expect. And basically the people of Rome were like, yeah, um, we don't have any food. So, <laughs> you know, anything you could spare would be really, really useful. And Eisenhower was like, all right, give me like two hours. And he like provided like the U.S. military was able to provide these ma just tons and tons of food for the people of Rome because the fascist government had been unable to do that. So that yeah. idea that like Mussolini made the trains run on time, yeah, is is a myth. Like these weren't yeah. well functioning, well ordered societies. They were well ordered military machines that existed to serve yeah. the war effort. My um. My grandfather was had fought in the um, the Axis side on the because he was Romanian. He was drafted, mm. and he said that one of the greatest days of his life was when he surrendered to the Allied Army and was put into the POW camp. It was bad. <laughs> so you can tell you that's a that's a clue on what that was like. Yeah. So, I mean, and and I mean, I think the same like. Romania definitely was in one of those sort of weird positions where like my my sense is the vast majority of the Romanian people were not supportive of the Axis, but the Romanian government was, and a lot of Romanians were drafted into the into yeah. the service. Um, yeah, he part of the story as he tells it is that he was being actually he was being chased by the SS. Because they wanted to switch uniforms with him so that they, that he would be executed as a member of the SS and they would just be trying to process his PFW. Yeah. And he, he, it's a pretty dramatic story the way he tells it. He's running over a hill away from the SS officers towards the Americans. Like, I surrender. <clears throat> so. Cool. I mean, yeah, good. I wouldn't say that you know most of the uh, most of the general uh, grunts of the of, of the populations really believed in the in the cause. But I will. Say, um, I did yeah. hear. I did read, a read an interesting uh, story about um, the end of the war for for Nazi Germany recently. That, that while the um, the Allies were closing in from the west and the Soviets were closing in from the east, instead of mm -hmm. taking the military and Re and reinforcing those fronts, what they did was send them to the concentration camps to try to finish up quicker before they had no time left. Yeah. Which really spoke to the corruption of that ideology. The fact that yeah. the cleansing of Europe was more important than the state surviving at all. Which was, which is like, which speaks to a lower, like a lower form of like insanity on their part that like, it doesn't matter what they do as long as they kill they kill all these all these people and they're gonna save the world if they, if they, even if they all die yeah well and so that that i mean again obviously this isn't an exact sort of parallel i mean yes they are nazis in the sense that they are literally nazis on echoes but we clearly aren't necessarily in quite the same situation but that again sort of brings us back to that just 180 degree turn in three seconds yeah and like, we, we we don't see we don't really see the extent of the persecution of the Zans by the yeah. oceans either we don't know what kind of population the Zans actually have on echoes um we don't see what they're doing with with the people that i know they say that the the um the protocol is to interrogate and execute but we don't see yeah. like any kind of apparatus or any kind of really acknowledgement of any kind of extermination of the Zeons on Echoes. It's just kind of uh, they kind of gloss it over as the, they're they're sending over the, the fleet to attack the planet Zeon itself, and they don't really deal with yeah. the Holocaust itself. That's an interesting point because it de what we see definitely is on a sort of individual level like individual Zeons getting beaten up, 
individual Zeons being executed in the street, but it, not not in the systematic way. I mean, they they do use the term the final solution, but that seems to be a military strategy in this case of going to at attack Zeon rather than what the final solution actually was in Nazi Germany, which was the Holocaust. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, there is a certain degree of ambiguity in this episode about what exactly the persecution of Zeons involves within Echos itself, and whether or not this is a Holocaust type situation in in that sort of industrial sense that the holocaust was or whether or not this is more sort of limited individual persecutions which, which i guess was more more accurate for like the early era of nazi germany the, like the mid 1930s before you really start having the development of concentration camps yeah, it it um it did definitely seem like the vibe that was exactly the vibe that uh, John Gale was trying to achieve because there there was always that there was always that sentence or that quote again I can't remember where the quote came from but uh, it was that like if if Adolf Hitler had been assassinated in 1936 he'd be like considered the greatest uh, German politician of all time or something like that. But before he, he he was he was considered so good at what he did before he did any of the the really bad stuff that uh, one, of, one of the really embarrassing Time Magazine Man of the Years. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, along with people like Stalin and Nasser, I don't know. So yeah. I want to I want to get a little more political. Uh, just uh, briefly, if we can, because the world that we live in today in 2023 has, again, this sort of resurgence of authoritarian, if not totalitarian leaders, um, including many would argue in the Republican Party here in the U.S., uh, Donald Trump, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ron DeSantis, these type of people. Uh, but certainly people like Putin, people like Erdogan, um, Xi Jinping. Is there, is there something, anything positive that we could sort of learn maybe from this episode for the world that we're in today, in your opinion? Something positive that, from this episode we could learn. <clears throat> well, the, the thing that springs immediately to mind is that people are always using power for their own agendas. And you saw you saw that with Gil. He used he used that for I mean his agenda, you know, was on the surface benign, but you saw the results of that. You saw Malakon's agenda. Um and even uh the resistance, they they used the members who um, were collaborating, they used their power to further their own agendas. And in, and you see, basically right now in American politics, uh, all of these figures that you described, Marjorie Taylor Greene, Ron DeSantis, Donald Trump, they are using the tools that have been refined for disinformation and like read and like the, it, it's it's like a, a recursive deployment of this disinformation. It's hard to tell where it started, but everything is is like up for grabs you see you see someone make a claim you see like you, you you'll you'll see a, a right wing poster on twitter make a claim that they will not question as absolute truth but then somebody else will make a claim and back up with a source and they'll be like well i don't believe that source and and, and so it becomes you're not going to believe any source unless it already agrees with what you believe and what they believe is basically what they, what makes them. 
it's hard to come up with the right words to describe it. It's basically what makes them feel feel more more secure. Um, yeah, I mean, the world is the world is a scary place, and there are no easy answers and and no easy solutions. And these these uh, figures are offering easy solutions for some problems that don't really even exist. Yeah. Um, like the 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 whole idea of the um, the children and the uh, gender transitioning it's 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 a it's a boogeyman there's been yep. the status like less than 5000 kids have received care in this manner in the last 5 years which is less less than 1000 they're saying that millions of kids are 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 being subjected to this they're they're trying to get every kid to do this it, it, it's happening yep. everywhere and it's it's, sim it's simply not it's simply just not true but they're pushing this narrative to people who um we'll just believe it and because it fits with their preconceived prejudices and beliefs um they'll they'll believe it's true and until uh, the day they, they die i don't really well, I, I don't know not. what hopefully that? not hopefully not um but i don't know how much we can get through to a lot of these people at this point um that's how good the propaganda has become e either that or how or how, how far we've fallen as, as a society but um there's no there's no value in expertise anymore there's no value in um experience it's just what what is the narrative and what is and every, anything that doesn't fit it is against the narrative um especially with this anti-woke movement now you can yeah. see clearly the motives because over the past decades you've seen each generation become more and more progressive and liberal and more accepting of people's differences and with that brings the extinction of conservative of the conservatism in the republican party as we know it i mean there was going to be some conservatives it's going to, it's going to transform yada 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 but yeah. the conservative that that they believe in is going away unless they can force people to not believe in it and that's what the motivation of the anti-woke legislation and movements are is to influence the young away from the trend of progressivism all right i actually think no i think that's a great uh I think that's a great summation of the unfortunately <clears throat> fairly dismal state of american politics right now um but it, i i really like what you had said at the beginning there of that of that um analysis this idea that the best thing we can do maybe is to question those who are pursuing power for their own ends to always be skeptical of that i think that's a really great insight and if we sort of followed that through with all of the other problems that you identified here i think we'd we'd be in a much better spot as a society so i think that's a yeah, good there, uh go ahead i was gonna say there's um there's a there's a saying that uh, science fiction author uh, robert anton wilson would say he, he would wake up in the morning he'd ask himself if he's being a cosmic schmuck which means like are you being used are you being like like is what you are what you're doing what you believe actually like what you want to do and what you want to believe and he says that people who don't who don't spend time thinking about whether or not they're being a cosmic schmuck are more likely to be a cosmic schmuck I think that's a great sentiment to wrap this interview up with. Um, so Matt, thanks for, for joining me. This has been a fantastic conversation. Thanks for having me. I had a great time. It's been a great conversation.